Hi, welcome to Conversations from Our Couch, a chance to chat with some experts in our community about important issues like our health, wellness, addiction, recovery, any topics that might be of interest to you. On today's conversation, we have Dr. Stephanie Reynolds, who is with the Hackensack Meridian Health Emergency Department. Yes. And we are going to have a little chat about addiction and the parallels to COVID-19. Um, we'd like to just give a shout out to one of our supporters, Coffee Corral. If you are interested in sponsoring one of our conversations from our couch or getting involved with Tigger House, please reach out to us at info at tiggerhouse.org. I'm Carla Scarabino. I'm the Chief Development Officer at Tigger House. I'm Dr. Stephanie Reynolds, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? First, it's my pleasure to be here, Carla. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm an emergency room physician. I've been practicing for over 20 years in New York City first and then in New Jersey, down here at the Jersey Shore, where is my home and I love it. My family is here, my friends are all here. I love being entrenched in the community. I chose a community hospital to be my home base because I love the idea of seeing my patients at the supermarket, at the post office, in their school when I drop off my children. It just makes me feel like I'm part of their lives and not just a moment in time. And when someone has an emergency and they come into my emergency room and they recognize me from the girl that was picking up pizza or the woman that was at the Girl Scout meeting for their daughter, it gives them a sense of, ah, oh, I recognize that face. It's a human being, not a white coat. And I wear my white coat because I'm very proud of earning my white coat, but it's a symbol of being a doctor and being in charge and being a calming influence in a chaotic situation. And when you're in an emergency room and you are looking for help, everybody's a blur, but when you see the long white coat and the stethoscope, you know that's the person in charge, that's the doctor. And when the face is someone you recognize, the package becomes much more calming and trusting. And that's the practice that I have in medicine. Well, we're so appreciative of everything you do. And I think your empathy and your love for our community definitely shines through. Um, today, what I thought would be really interesting is to talk about what we're starting to call the parallel epidemic. And I think prior to COVID, we were facing a huge epidemic, which is the opioid epidemic. Yes. Um, and then unfortunately in March of 2020, we had the COVID, COVID pandemic mm. and um, that created a lot of fear, worry, isolation. Um, I'd love for you to talk to us about how COVID and addiction do have some similarities and some overlaps. It's a very interesting parallel. And we had a conversation about a month and a half, two months ago, about how the similarities are there with addiction. When you have the addiction stigma, which I hate that word, but it truly is a stigma in our society, it parallels with the pandemic of back in the plague, back in the 1800s, the doors were shut, people were terrified. And now we have the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. And March 10th, everyone was going about their lives. There's this thing in the back of your mind on CNN, oh, people are getting sick out West. What's going on? Doctors are starting to be concerned. We're starting to mobilize meetings. And then all of a sudden on March 17th, boom, the doors all close, everybody's shut in and everyone has to experience the isolation and the fear. My house was no different than anybody else's house. And when I got to work, I started realizing that the doors are locked everywhere. They're locked to people who have the coronavirus, but at the same time, they're locked to people who have an addiction history. Whether it be a recent history or a remote history, the doors are locked in a lot of places. I would leave work, and because of the work that I do in the emergency room, I would get undressed in the garage, leave everything there, put on the bathroom, and come into the house. Even my family was trying to isolate me from them with love, but still to isolate. And you think about someone who comes in that's 32 years old, that's fighting an addiction. They're hiding in the garage. They're hiding from their family. They don't want them to see them coming down from a, an overdose or a, a high that they just had from the heroin. They're hiding in the garage. They're hiding in the bathroom. Quick, let me get out of the clothes that smell like marijuana so my parents don't see it. 
And the similarity of coming home and stripping off the stigma of being exposed to COVID is very similar to coming home and trying to leave the addiction stigma in the garage. And when you look at it, the isolation of having the doors close on you, when people find out, oh, you have COVID, oh, you were exposed to that, I might get that, is similar to, oh, you used heroin in the past. You know what, I'm gonna move a little bit further away in case it's contagious. Mm -hmm. And people have this fear that it's that evil is contagious and coronavirus evil, heroin addiction evil, pills or alcohol addiction evil. It's not evil. It's just part of our community. It's part of the fabric that makes up our lives. And we have to accept that that fabric is built into us. And if we can't accept somebody for the whole fabric, what kind of people are we? I agree. I agree. Wow. Um, you said that so well, and it's so true. And I think if we all think back to those times, we can maybe understand some of the feelings that someone in addiction is going through. The other thing that I was thinking <clears throat> about is even some of the fear, right? The unknown. And oh. when someone, especially a family, struggles with a loved one going through addiction, there's so much fear and unknown. The fear, and again, very similar parallel. <clears throat> very similar parallel in that the fear of what's going to happen to my son, what's going to happen to my daughter, how is it going to reflect on me? Even though as a parent, you don't want to be the one that says, how is this going to look to everybody? Mm -hmm. It's there. It's in everybody's head because everyone is judged in our, in our community, even though judge not lest be judged is the life that we should live. It's not. The reality is you look at someone and you think of how they appear how their hair looks, how their clothes look. And you think, oh, a junkie. Junkie's gonna have that gaunt face and the dirty hair. And the, that's not it. That's not what we see. Mm -hmm. But the same with the coronavirus parallel, mm -hmm. someone who has COVID, oh, they've got 107 fever and they're coughing their lungs out and blood is coming. No, but that's the image people have in their head mm -hmm. that the air around them is toxic. Mm -hmm. And the isolation and the fear that that toxicity is going to transmit mm -hmm. to the family members, to their neighbors. We've got to pull down the shades. Nobody can see what's going on in our house. It's the big secret. Mm -hmm. And in March and April, the big secret was, you have COVID? Shh, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. What if they find out? And in the, the early 2000s and the 2000 teens, the big secret was, shh, you're addicted to pills? you're on heroin, pull down the curtains, nobody can tell. And it's fear, mm -hmm. fear that you're gonna expose their child, fear that you're gonna expose their grandparent. And it's a very similar anxiety that people have, good people, people who are not bigots or racists or hypocritical, but they have this primitive fear to protect themselves mm -hmm. and their family. And they build this wall around themselves and at the same time, on the other side of that wall is one of their family members or their next door neighbor or their school teacher. And it's either COVID or heroin or alcohol, but you don't know what that person's struggling with, but you've just built that wall and they're on the wrong side of that wall. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. mental health comes into play in all of this. One of my friends was a physician in New York City and she killed herself in the coronavirus. And you look and she didn't kill herself because of addiction. She didn't kill herself because of stigma. She was overwhelmed with grief and fear of this virus overtaking her life and she killed herself. And then you look and you say, hmm, everyone was afraid. How afraid was she that she killed herself? Everyone's afraid of heroin and pills and alcohol. They're just things and looking at it as a thing a bacteria, a virus, they're things. You protect yourself from those things, but isolating yourself from those things is not an intelligent approach. And we're an intelligent species. Use your brain. Think about what it is that you're trying to protect yourself from. Pill addiction is not contagious. Alcoholism is not contagious. The coronavirus is contagious, but if you take precautions, it's not contagious. You get a vaccine, you wear a mask, you stay six feet apart, you're safe. You can still be that mother to your child and that teacher to that student. 
whether you embrace the addiction as part of your life and part of your past. Coronavirus is in my past. Addiction is in my past. Don't be afraid of that person. You need to try to understand. And knowledge is power. Absolutely. Absolutely. I also think as you were speaking, I was thinking about how coronavirus, like addiction, really didn't discriminate. It didn't matter what age you were, right? At first we thought right. that it was age. It didn't matter what demographic, where you lived or anything. So I think that's another amazing right. parallel. Um, it's not based Random. on anything. Mm -hmm. Random. You are the high school teacher, the fifth grade teacher that takes the kids on class trips. And on one of the class trips, you fall and you break your ankle. And now you're addicted to pills, but you're still that classroom teacher. You're still the next door neighbor. You're still little Mary Jane's mother, but now you're addicted to pills. Do you look any different? No. If you have COVID and you're asymptomatic, do you look any different? No. You could be standing next to them in the supermarket. How are you supposed to be able to judge that person and be comfortable with yourself? So do you judge everybody now? Oh, everyone, let me see what they look like. There's no scarlet letter on your chest that says A for addiction or C for COVID, you have to open your mind and open up your eyes. And the similarities are uncanny. It really is. Like, and the more you think about it, I remember at the beginning of COVID actually being fearful of other people. Like, oh, they might have it. Oh, don't go near them. Oh, right. in the supermarket, don't get close. And yes, we were protecting ourselves, but almost to a degree that it became you know, just we're, we're almost yes. repelled by other people. And I think that was, that was really difficult. That it, was really hard. It went from a level of the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When you look at that pyramid, those of us who had to take psychology in, in college, <laughs> remember the base of the pyramid is primal instincts of survival. Mm -hmm. And as you go up the pyramid, it's lifestyle and fun things and how can I make my life better? But that primal base of the pyramid is where people reverted to in March. Mm -hmm. And when you walk into a community or a room with addicts that are alcohol addicted or sex addicts or tobacco or marijuana or pills, you look and immediately your first instinct is basement level of that pyramid. Mm -hmm. I have to protect myself. People in this room are dangerous. People in this room are making me scared. People in this room have COVID. They're making me scared. And the, the similarity of fear and indiscriminate what you were saying mm -hmm. who has it who doesn't have right. it and who's hiding it right when someone is an active addict and they're in the midst of withdrawal or overdose it's very easy to identify them. Mm -hmm. when someone is in the midst of covid with the fevers and the sweats and the coughs it was very easy as a physician to identify those people up oh, that one's covid up oh, that one's covid but when you put the veil down and now you're not going through withdrawal, you're silently using, whether it's alcohol and people think it's a water bottle and it's a vodka bottle, mm -hmm. or whether it's heroin or pills and you have silent COVID in you. Mm -hmm. That's where these feelings in your stomach start to make you tense around everybody. Mm -hmm. You avoid people, mm -hmm. you avoid anybody that's suspect. Oh, that's a late model car. Maybe they're driving that car because they're addicted. Uh, I'm, you become so paranoid of everybody Absolutely. around you, it controls your life and it takes your personality away. And you become that person that you never wanted to be. Mm -hmm. You become so introverted, doors locked, windows closed, shades down, nobody comes in, nobody goes out. I don't talk to the mailman. This is the mailman, you've known him for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, wait, uh, I don't know what's going on in his life. I don't know, is he safe? Who's he mingling with? Right you become this shut in and, and then you become paranoid and you become aggressive and your whole life is turned upside down because of fear. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I think when it, when, and if it did strike you, people were afraid to get help, right? So now we were afraid, I think I have COVID, but if I get the COVID test and it's positive, everyone's going to know I'm positive. Yes. And I think that that's similar to the, what we see in the world of addiction, even once a person's ready and say, I want help. But now they're afraid, right? Who do I call? Are they going to tell people? Are they going to tell my employer? Right. And then I, I think again, another very how safe am I to come forward situation? Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Hi, my name is Stephanie. I have COVID. 
You know, it becomes right. that, are, are you safe to say that? Mm -hmm. And when people would come into the emergency room, it became work to ask them, well, were you exposed? Might have been. There might have been somebody at work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you use alcohol? Well, once in a while. Well, how do you define once in a while? Mm -hmm. Do you take pain medication? Only when I really need it. Okay. So let's talk about when do you really need it? I'll close the curtain and we can have a private conversation. Oh, my mom's in the room. Mm -hmm. And as a physician, I had to work hard to pull out, could you possibly have been exposed to COVID? The same way I had to pull out, do you use drugs? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very subtle conversation that we had to have with people in the beginning with COVID. Because when you did test positive, the name went to the Department of Health and someone's gonna call you. Oh dear God, someone's gonna call my house that list is going to be out there. I know everybody knows everything about, you know, Siri in the kitchen. She knows what's going on in your bedroom. And that list is going to be public. <laughs> and oh, oh, you're addicted to heroin. Mm -hmm. That's going to be public. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's going to find out that I was in the emergency room because, yeah, you know, I know you have regulations, but someone's going to tell. Someone's going to say, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to get help. Right. I'm just going to sit here and get worse and get sicker and sicker and be fearful of getting help. And by the time you come in, whether it was with COVID or with heroin, you're at a point of desperation mm -hmm. and, and you're so sick or you're trying to do detox on your own and you're going through withdrawal from alcohol and now you've got the shakes and you're hallucinating and you're so fearful that your family doesn't know you're going through this and they think you're having a seizure or you've had a stroke because you're not making sense and you're sweating. Maybe maybe something's wrong. You're having an allergic reaction. And when you get to the hospital, you as a physician have to slide that slippery slope or do they have COVID? I know that they're sick. Do they have COVID? I'm really not at liberty to say. And we all know what that means. Right. We all know when a doctor says, I'm not at liberty to say that's yes. That means yes, they've got it. Whatever it is you're afraid of. when the doctor says, I'm not at liberty to discuss that. Your worst nightmare is immediately in the front of your head. Mom's got COVID. What are we going to do? What are the neighbors going to say? Mm -hmm. Or did he really overdose? No, mm -hmm. he had a seizure. He had, it couldn't have been from the Xanax. It couldn't have been. My son doesn't do Xanax. Well, then, you know, you have to find a way to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. Right. It was very difficult with COVID trying to tell people it's okay. It's okay. You know what? We'll just tell people you have strep throat. You can tell people whatever yeah. you want giving people alibis on what to say so it was socially acceptable. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. And it's funny, we really didn't come to that realization until after. And I think it's just something for anyone who's, who's watching this to kind of have that empathy and think about it. Think about what we went through. Right. And think about what, unfortunately, people with addiction are still going through. Um, and it hasn't really changed dramatically, but unfortunately the addiction numbers oh. are going to be up and much worse. They're much higher right mm -hmm. now than we saw pre-COVID. We were making serious inroads mm -hmm. in the addiction community. Last two Decembers ago, January, looking at the numbers from the year before, very positive. We made a lot of inroads in treatment, in opening up the door, mm -hmm. opening up the shades. It's okay to say that you have these problems. And all of a sudden, once COVID hit, all those people that were about to come out, about to get mm -hmm. help, or were in the midst of their first 30 days mm -hmm. of help, yeah, everything's shut, everything's closed. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I can't get to the doctor's office. The doctor's offices are closed. I can't go out. I can't go to the train station to score my heroin. What am I going to do? If I walk around the train station, everyone's going to see me. They're going to know what I'm out here for. Huh. And then the black market started and mm -hmm. things on the internet. And dropping a brown paper bag at your door. Absolutely. Was it Amazon delivering or was it pills being delivered? It, all these people that are, were plunged into darkness were now seeing the, the implications of people who were struggling with addiction and the things that they turned to and the way they went to get help or to get their fix, to get their alcohol. The fact that the governor made it okay to deliver alcohol to your house, mm -hmm. I mean, Yes, it helped with people who were alcoholics. It prevented them from going into acute withdrawal and winding up in the emergency room. But 
do you think that also played into the problem? Absolutely. It didn't offer them the mental health mobile stations that we should have been putting out there. Mm. But mm. we should have put Winnebago's that were sanitized. You wear a mask, you wash your hands, you come in, you do a rapid test, 15 minutes, you sit in the waiting room. Okay, you don't have active COVID. Come on and let's talk to a mental health counselor. Instead, we set up all these mobile test places for COVID. But how about we should have set up these mobile test places for mental health issues, for the average person who was struggling with addiction. They weren't quite addicted to the exactly. pills. They weren't quite addicted to the alcohol. Now they're working from home. No need to get up on time. No exactly. need to shower. No need to get dressed. How can I do my Zoom conference call hungover from drugs or alcohol? And we allowed this to just fester absolutely, without the help that, that needed to be done. And the connection was lost. There's a famous quote that says the opposite of addiction is connection. And I think as a, as a community, our entire world lost that connection. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, we've really tried, I know through Tigger House it was tough in the beginning with our Zoom presentations. Yeah. And we did get our students together every week. And thank goodness but you we made did. An effort. Right. You reached out. Mm -hmm. And so even physicians were afraid mm -hmm. in the beginning. They were afraid to see their clients. They were afraid to see their patients. I have friends who their children are in therapy and the therapist was trying to figure out how to do Zoom and how to do, mm -hmm. can we just talk on the phone? And well, okay, we can set up phone calls. But when you're in crisis, Sometimes it's your persona that says you're in crisis, Absolutely. not your voice. Mm -hmm. Look at television actors. They're in crisis 90% of their lives, but you turn on the camera, everything's great. Right. Everything's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to show, nothing to hide here. Keep moving, nothing to see. Exactly. And you know, therapists need the, that touch and the warmth and the feel. Mm -hmm. And as a physician, when I walk in and I touch you like this, I can tell so much just from my hand on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we were a touchless community. Okay, I'll touch you, but only with my elbow. And oh. so here's someone struggling with addiction that just needs someone to see them. Exactly. exactly. And what do you see? A television screen. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing me. You're seeing the television screen. You're seeing the makeup and the, the glasses and I brushed my hair and I look okay. Everything's good. Meanwhile, from the collar down, I've lost 30 pounds. I'm wearing last week's clothes and I'm struggling. I haven't eaten. The dishes are not done. The house is a mess. Absolutely. You know, and with the shut-in from COVID, it was a blanket. Not only the addicted community, but also the medical community suffered. But the addicted community had no place to turn. You know, we definitely found that. I mean, our phones were definitely ringing a lot more. We we're very fortunate that we had just recently brought on an addiction navigator. So thank goodness we had done that. Um, but a lot of our calls were not only from the people in addiction, but from their loved ones. What do I do? My right. loved one can't find a meeting. That was a big thing for us. So we were able, thank goodness, to have this person that can reach, just reach out. How are you doing today? Oh, What's going on? So important. What do you do? Can you get out? Why don't you get outside? Why don't you, why don't you take Go a breath of fresh air? And that became really a lifeline for many people. Um, and again, the parallels between COVID and, and addiction, there just was nowhere. You didn't know where to turn, right? right. What do you do? You I have even, COVID. What do I do? But I, you could even know. go to your doctor's right. office. Rest. <laughs> you know, I've got some aches. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You can't don't go to your doctor. In. Don't come in. Go to the hospital. And people aren't going to go to the hospital. Oh my gosh, people are dying from COVID. Mm -hmm. They're horrible COVID. I'm not going to the hospital. Right. So I can't go to the doctor's office. I can't go to the hospital. The urgent cares were turning people away if they were symptomatic because mm -hmm. they didn't want their other patients exposed. Absolutely. It became this slippery slope of, I have really nowhere to go. And as a community physician, half of Monmouth County and some of Ocean County has my cell phone. So my phone rang every single day. Where can I get tested? What should I do? Mm -hmm. How do I know if I have it? Um, I have it, but please, dear God, don't tell anybody. What should I do? What medicines mm -hmm. should I take? And me, my husband and kids will tell you, my phone never stopped. I answered every call. I talked people literally off the ledge of what do I do? Where do I go? And occasionally there were people with mental health crisis that called Absolutely. me and said, I don't know where my therapist is. They've locked the door. They've shut their business down. And I don't think they're going to start again. And it's a three month wait to get to this psychiatrist, even on a phone call. What do I do? Who do I talk to? And I was struggling with trying to use all of my connections mm -hmm. to help people. Yeah, it's crazy, crazy times. 
Um, and I think, I mean, for me, the takeaway from our conversation is that, you know, we have to be aware of what people with addiction go through so that we can help them mm -hmm. and to help eliminate the stigma and to let them know we're here for them. The other takeaway is, I mean, I did have COVID, I will admit, and remembering that uncertainty and knowing that people with addiction, unfortunately, it's not the prognosis of, oh, I'm going to get better in a couple of days, knowing right. that this is part of my daily routine. So having a little more empathy. Um, do you have any takeaways from the whole entire, I mean, you have some great thoughts, I think, about these mobile um, mental health, yeah. which we should definitely explore. But do you have any other takeaways from the time um, during the pandemic that we could use to help those um, struggling with addiction? I think fear. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful four letter word that dictates your life. It has this grip on your heart of uncertainty of what's going to happen if I tell somebody. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Open up, open up your heart, open up your mouth, say, I have a problem. Because if you don't ask for help, sometimes help doesn't know you need it. If you don't say to your parents, I'm ready for help. If you don't say to your girlfriend, I think we've done enough of this. I think it's time that we get clean. I think I need to figure out why I'm using the heroin. Don't let fear control your future. When you were 15 or 13, did you think that fear was going to drive you in a direction of isolation? No, mm -hmm. you didn't let that navigate your life. You were looking at high school sports and you were looking at colleges and girlfriends and boyfriends. And your biggest fear was, is this boy going to ask me out? Or what if the girl says no? Those were your fears. Mm -hmm. Think about how that was all controlling in your life at that time. And now the fear of being found out or the fear of what happens if I stop using heroin? I know people go through those terrible withdrawals and I don't want that. I don't want the, the drug sick. Don't be so afraid. There's a lot out there that mm -hmm. we can do for you. And there are the long haulers with COVID mm -hmm. that wake up every day the same way the I stopped, I'm 30 days clean. I'm 15 days clean. I'm two days clean. I'm two days out of the hospital from COVID. Am I going to have this cough for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. Am I going to have the nerve damage for the rest of my life? I'm going to be a heroin addict for the rest of my life. And now I'm just going to have to embrace that and not be afraid of it. And I should be in charge of that instead of that being in charge of me. And I tell the patients with the long haul COVIDs, you need to be in charge of that. Don't be afraid. You take charge. And if you're not strong enough to take charge, we have people who can hold your hand. We have people who can stand behind you. We have people who can stand next to you. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. That's an excellent point. Couldn't have said it better. And I think um, just for those watching with Tigger House, I mean, we're, we're here. We can we have people to stand by you and we have excellent doctors. And even as you were speaking, I was thinking about that medicine has caught up and I think science has caught up with COVID. In the world of addiction, there is so much science mm -hmm. and there is so much being done to help that. Right now, there are medications. I mean, there's possible vaccines right. um, to help with addiction in the future. So I think it is something that we should be a little more hopeful about. Optimistic. Mm -hmm. there Absolutely. Is, there's a light at the end of that darkness. Mm -hmm. And it, the tunnel may be as long as the Lincoln Tunnel for you, but know that on the other side is brightness. Mm -hmm. Know that on the other side is hope, is future, is opportunity. And I like to think of the other side of the Lincoln Tunnel is New York City bright, full of life, full of hope, full of opportunity. On the other side of addiction is that, is people who love you and care about you and opportunity and brightness and success. Yes, perfect, wonderful. Dr. Reynolds, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, this, this was so my pleasure. Unbelievable. I, I enjoyed this tremendously. And if you're in the community and you need someone at the hospital, you can look for my face. Here it is, <laughs> lots of oil of Olay, not changing. So you can come into the hospital and know that if I'm on, I will take very good care of you and my staff will take good care of you. And you know that the hospitals in our community really have come a long way with addiction. And we try to embrace the person, not the illness. And we try to remember that 
you're someone's mother, father, sister, brother, daughter, son, not just the addiction. I agree. I agree. And thank you so much. We're so grateful for the support. Um, Tigger House is here. You can call us at any point. You can email us. You can reach out in any way. Um, And we are here to help you navigate Um, the world of addiction. Look out for more conversations from our couch. Reach out to us if you have any topics you'd like us to address and have a great day. Thank you. Take care. Be safe.